Mia Thorpe drove the road ahead of her, long and twisting, dark. She'd been driving on and off for two days. Was stiff and bleary-eyed from the trip. She'd stopped last night at a motel for a fitful sleep, half waiting for word from Rafe that didn't come. Don't worry if you don't hear from me, he told her. Cell phone service is spotty. Just follow the directions. I'll be there when you get there. She believed him. She trusted him. She did. She laid on the hard, uncomfortable mattress in a motel room that smelled like cigarette smoke and industrial strength cleaner. Each time she managed to drift off, a passing car would cast its headlights on the wall beside her bed, shining through the two thin curtains, waking her. She doubted if she napped for two solid hours. She was on the road again before the sun rose. I think I love him, Mom, she said aloud, though her mother was long gone. Mia was sure she was still listening. When Mia was six, she wanted to change her name to Princess Rainbows. She knew that it was possible to change her name because her dad told her that when she was growing up, she could change her name to whatever she wanted. But while she was still his girl, she would very much like her to keep the name that he and Mommy had given her. A name is like a gift, he told her. We gave it we gave it a lot of thought and picked something we thought was beautiful as you are. Miss Mia Bell Thorpe, and technically isn't Bell a princess name? That was true, but there were three other Mias in her class and one other Belle, and a Bella and an Isabella who liked to be called Izzy. Mia Bell wasn't like Mia was with the red hair who frowned miserably at her corner desk and cried all the time. She wasn't like the Mia who was really good at math and always shot her hand up like a rocket when it was time to volunteer to solve problems at the board. And she definitely wasn't like shy Mia who was pale as an egg and never spoke at all and was frequently absent. She was Mia, herself. She didn't want to be one of four Mias in the room. The teacher, to avoid confusion, took it to calling them by first and last name. Mia Thorpe. She remembered hating that. She couldn't even say why. Maybe it started then, this idea that she had to assert her specialness. Her mom always told her she was special and that she was pretty and smart and a ray of sunshine. There's no one like you, little star. You're my special girl. But how could that be true if there were three other Mias in her classroom alone? Mia Bell Thorpe was pretty sure that no one else in the world was named Princess Rainbows. Around the same time, she discovered the wild pleasure of slamming doors in anger. She was often, after another argument erupted, after her afternoon snack when she listed all the ways in which having the same name as three other people had annoyed or inconvenienced her that day, her mother ended it by saying, Mia Bell Thorpe, you will not discuss this further. You are not changing your name to Princess Rainbows. Now please go do your homework. Mia had stormed up the stairs and slammed the door so hard she could she could making it seem and like the whole house vibrated with misery. She lay on her bed weeping and must have fallen asleep because when she woke up, the afternoon had turned to dusk. The light in her room was an unfamiliar gray. She and her mother are rarely argued. Mia might get very mad at her dad for being bossy or for tooting or for trying to help with the math when he really had no idea what he was doing. But her mother was soft and sweet and rarely said no, always knew how to fix something that was wrong and consistently smelled like flowers. And when Mia woke up, she felt regretful for storming off and slamming the door so hard. The house was quiet when she left her room. She felt odd because usually she could hear her mom in the kitchen cooking or talking on the phone with a friend or listening to the radio while she made dinner. There were all kinds of familiar noises in the house, but silence was not one of them. She crept down the stairs. It was easy to apologize to her mother. She knew it would be accepted with hugs and a kind conversation about why things couldn't be the way Mia wanted them to be. There would be some consolation prize, maybe a cookie or a concession or another matter of conflict. But when she entered the kitchen, she found her mother lying on the floor. One of her mom's Red velvet flats had fallen off her teeny foot, and it looked like she was sleeping. Mom, she said, sitting down beside her. Mommy, I'm sorry. But her mom didn't stir, and Mia lay down beside her, resting her head on her chest. She knew that something was horribly wrong, but she pushed it so deep, squeezed her eyes shut, and held on tight. She was sleeping. She'd wake up soon. There's where her father found them when, me, when he came home from work not long after. The sound of his wailing would stay with Mia for the rest of her life. It's not your fault. This was the single phrase she heard most often after that day, from her father, from therapists, from aunts and uncles. But Mia knew how much her mother hated when she was slammed the door. Truth be told, that's why she slammed it harder than she had ever before. And so, no matter how many times people told her it wasn't her fault, 
She knew that it was. Mia's mother had asthma. They'd recently had to change her medication. She'd ignored warning signs, the shortness of breath, dizziness. She'd had a heart attack. No one's fault, not really, but Mia knew that being upset could aggravate her mom's asthma. She wasn't upset, her father, Henry told her. She called me after you fought. She said that Princess Rainbows is at it again. We thought it was funny and cute. She wasn't mad at you. She was never mad at you. Mia didn't believe him. And while she loved her father, it was true that she loved him somewhat less than she had loved her mother. It was also true that a very special kind of light that her mother brought into her life and into her home went dark. Though there was still light, and it wasn't anything like the light that came from her mother's love. And her father, who had always been goofy and funny and full of laughter, with big appetites and grand ideas and big plans for day trips and vacations, seemed to deflate, go pale and quiet. The world should have ended. It did not end for me and Henry in all sorts of ways. It just didn't for anyone else. They both went on in an unfamiliar gray light together with the person they loved less than they had loved her. It wasn't until years later in rehab for the first time that Mia Bell Thorpe worked to unpack the moment from her life. How everything that went wrong for her started there. How every moment after she was colored by the loss of her mother, she was special after that. She wasn't math Mia or shy Mia or grouchy Mia. She was Mia whose mommy had died. Mia Bell meant my pretty or my dear one. It was special because it was the name her mother had given her. She wished she could tell her mother that she knew that now. Now. <laughs> now, the farther she went on the dark road, the more of herself she left behind. All the people she'd been, the pampered little girl, the child who'd lost her mother, the angry teenager, the addict, the recovering addict, the person struggling, always struggling to find the specialness she'd seen reflected in her mother's eyes. You were special to her. You were special to me, her father told her. That's the only special anyone needs. She left everything that tethered her to her life behind. She would had, hadn't called her father to say goodbye. She didn't like, he didn't really like Rafe, and he didn't understand the relationship, so there was no point in fighting about her plans. After a while, she'd send him a letter explaining. She imagined that it would be a relief to have some distance for both of them. Her father had a girlfriend now. She seemed nice, had reached out to me at, multiple times but no no just no maybe if Mia and her father had some space from each other from the memory of their loss they could each be happy for a while she loved her father but it didn't make her happy to be with him she strongly suspected that he felt the same way about her let's leave the toxic modern world behind for a while maybe not forever but for now I know a place where we can be free that's what Rafe had said to her when he issued her his invitation Sounded right to her. On this dark road, with just a burner phone she'd picked up at a drugstore, all the chatter had gone quiet. There were no social media notifications, no constant pinging announcing the ugly news headlines or junk emails. No endless texts from friends with memes and plans for the evening. There were no podcasts, no Siri to ask about the weather, or whatever. The car she'd picked up at a lot, as Rafe had directed her to. Just had an AM FM radio. As she drove the station, she could receive change. The country music station faded away into static. She cast about and found some classic rock station with a mouthy DJ that eventually devolved into white noise, too. For a while, all she could get was a Christian sermon filled with fire and brimstone. She listened for miles just because she found that she was afraid of silence. She'd had the map he'd left her, figured how to use it. He'd marked on the map where she should stop for gas, no cameras, pay cash. But slowly she learned to let the quiet wrap around her. Finally, the nervous chatter of her mind quieted as well. She hadn't seen another car for hours. Above, there were only stars and stars and stars until the light of the rising sun brightened the sky. She didn't know the place she was going or how long she would be there, but she knew that for the first time in her life, she could taste freedom.